Hey guys, Brian here from Better Chest Training, and in this video, I use the concepts of space and development in order to gain a positional advantage on my opponent and convert it into a victory. Check it out. Okay, this game is one I played on the Internet Chess Club last week. I was preparing to do a video by continuing my series on reviewing the games from a recent tournament I played in. But uh, this was a pretty nice game, and I thought illustrated some important fundamental points. So uh, let's get right into it here. Uh, I played d4, and my opponent played b6. And uh, in and of itself is not a losing move. And, and I, I think sometimes players, I mean, more commonly, of course, would be uh, d5 or knight to f6. And that's what I would actually recommend people play against d4. But with b6, uh, he's playing to Pianchetto this bishop, and I think try to get out of uh, mainstream theory. So uh, with that in mind, I just continue on with knight to f3, and he plays e6. Now, here, uh, again, this is not an unusual. I mean, it is a little unusual, but it's not outside of uh, opening theory. Now, those of you who watch my videos, you've seen I've played e3 a lot. Uh, setting up a Kali system. But here, because he's not contesting the center, I decided to go with e4. Let's go ahead and, and take up space in the center. And we'll see throughout this game how that extra space uh, plays out for me. Uh, space is one of those things where uh, often it can be an advantage, but not always because it always, you know, it allows, sometimes allows your opponents to counterattack as well. But let's see what happened here. Okay, he plays bishop to b7, natural follow-up to b6, and I play knight b to d2. Now here he plays knight to f6, now he's attacking uh, this pawn twice, and so I defend it with this bishop. Uh, and here is sort of one of the ideas behind these types of openings. He is going to attack, he allows me to build up this center, and then he's going to attack it here with c5. So... The idea here is that if I take here on c5, well, now he has a nice, you know, gets this bishop out, and uh, my center is not so strong anymore, and maybe he can come out with d5 at some point, uh, and he's going to be able to castle. But uh, instead, in this situation, uh, I played c3, with the intention if he does take here on d4, I'm just going to take with the c-pawn and maintain this nice classical center. Okay, he plays uh, d6, <clears throat> and I castle. Plays bishop to e7, he's planning to castle. Pretty straightforward here, and I play uh, queen to e2. So now, uh, a couple reasons behind this. Sometimes in these situations, if he doesn't, black doesn't think that he has um, many prospects on this diagonal, he might play bishop to a6. So queen to e2 shuts that out. That I can now capture on a6. But more importantly, now I'm thinking of pushing e5, okay? So when you're studying your openings, you want to understand uh, the general plans behind them. And in this particular structure, I've often found that uh, pushing the e5 pawn is very helpful, both getting more space, but also either developing an outpost on e5 and in general disrupting uh, black's development and and his king side uh, you know if you if you dislodge that knight from f6 that's one of his main defenders of the king side going back here so now black castles and i'm just developing and preparing this e5 push uh maybe i can play it right now for example uh but i don't think it hurt to uh i don't think it hurt to prepare it for an extra move so rook to e1, and here he plays h6. Uh, this is one of those situations where not quite sure where he's going with that. Now, based on what he does in the game, maybe he's preparing to, to put his knight there. Um, one idea I've seen here is that he puts his knight on h7, and then he plays his bishop out to get some trades here, because he's lacking in space for his pieces, and so those trades, a uh, general principle is uh, you want to trade when you're 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 the one who has less space. But h6, I didn't really see as that big of a deal. In any case, uh, e5 
uh, is played here. And he takes, and here, I think it's a mistake to take with the knight because then he can take here and win a pawn. Okay. So uh, here I took with pawn. And as I said, now uh, his knight is banished from the f6 square. So he goes back to h7. Okay. And here you can see with this pawn here, now I have this nice d6 square that uh, can potentially be of use. So I play knight to e4. And again, I don't need to go there right away, but I can uh, find the right time. Now, of course, here if he tries to trade this off, gets into a little bit of trouble because I'm threatening mate here as well as uh, this rook over here. So I would win, uh, you know, after say g6, then I win the rook. So that's why uh, capturing on e4, not an option for me. Okay, so he plays rook to e8. And I play bishop to f4, just clearing this back rank because I want to bring my rook over and also just uh, protecting this pawn. Okay. Knight to d7. Now he's putting a little pressure on his pawn, trying to get his development going. But you can see this pawn, really, with this knight, you know, f6 not being available, this knight's going to be out of play for a while. Again, maybe you can try some trades here on g5. But with my knight on e4, uh, it doesn't really work out. You know, I have too many, too many forces on here as well. Okay, now I get my rook over. Now let's just take a look at this position for a second. Uh, you can see here that uh, my rooks are nice and connected. This rook is bearing down on this open file where this queen is, so that's got to be a little uncomfortable. His knights don't really have a good place to go right now. I mean, this knight could probably go to f8, uh, but then this knight's just stuck here for a while. Uh, at some point, you know, normally when you have this wedge here, you'd want to break here with f6, but then this e6 pawn becomes incredibly weak with my pieces down here. So here, even though material is even, hope you guys can see that I have an incredible positional advantage. You can see these light squares are also weak. This bishop can come down, for example, here to b5 with this pin, and life is looking good for the white pieces. Okay, so queen to c7, pretty useful move, attacking uh, this on twice, currently not protected Actually, it's protected twice, uh, but also, more importantly, this queen gets off of the, the d file. So here I, I saw my opportunity with knight to d6. And you have to calculate these things because you don't want to put this knight here. So this knight on d6 is very powerful, so you don't want to have it traded off unless you're going to get something good for it. Okay, So in this case... The tactical ramifications uh, work out in my favor. Let's take a look here. So he trades here on d6. I take back with the pawn. Now this pawn becomes a pass pawn. And sometimes that can be a little dangerous because uh, I can't really bring any other pawns to protect it. But as you'll see, because it's uh, I have this my rook as well as my bishop here, uh, I'm not really too too worried. Plus. When I capture here, I'm attacking this queen, so he doesn't have time to develop you know, a way to, to attack this right away. Okay, so this pawn is very, very nice here. Okay, moves to uh, c8. Um, I'm going to move to d8. The uh, computer engine likes that a little better. And the reason that, just on a, a tactical standpoint, is that if this knight ever moves, there's no potential forks. Okay, but he moves to c8, and here, another nice positional move, I want to trade off this knight. Why is that? Because this knight right now is the, is, is, is the best blockader of this pawn. Okay, if he can keep this knight here, he never has to worry about this past pawn. Uh, and even though he could put another piece there, it, uh, it's not really as effective, because uh, the knight can... From d7, blocking this pawn can jump out where he needs to, 
uh, to for both offense and defense. Whereas either a rook or a queen really is not as effective anymore because it can't uh, can't move around. Okay, so uh, he trades, and I take back with the bishop. So now, if you can see here, uh, my sights can look over here towards the the king side, and I have this nice healthy pawn. And at some point, I can threaten here as well. Okay, so uh, he makes this threat here against my my uh, king. Of course, he's threatening checkmate, so I have to do something about that. In the game, I uh, well, what I, I analyze it, and actually a move like this, queen to g4 would have been very powerful here, and uh, both defending against the mate as well as threatening mate. And then after, is let's say he defends with g6, then d7 is really nice. But I could even consider uh, going ahead and um, going ahead here and sacrificing. And of course, if he takes, then uh, checkmate is going to be coming very soon. Simple like that. Uh, or the analysis shows you'd have to trade off here uh, with queen to g2 check. Queen takes g2. Bishop takes g2. And then I get this check in, taking this knight. And after he takes back, I'm a piece up. Okay, after I take back here. So uh, queen to g4 would have been a better move, but in this case, like I said, I have an advantage. So f3 just shutting out. The queen, and I have a nice positional advantage. Okay, he plays f6, and here uh, calculated this out a little bit, and I have this nice skewer of his queen and rook. Okay, and I came up well. Of course. If he moves his queen out of the way, and the only safe square uh, is c8, then I just get this fork in, okay, and, and pretty much a uh, very decisive advantage. Now, he comes up with an interesting move, but I had already seen that it also gives me uh, an advantage, and here he plays. Bishop to a6. So the idea is he's cross, uh, he's pinning my, my bishop. But here's the problem with it, is that after I take, which is what I did in the game, I have another fork here. So I'm forking his two rooks. Now, after he takes back, all I have to do is simply take back. Okay? Because now he's going to lose at least the exchange here. Plus, I have this advanced pawn. So you can see here, the game is just about over. You can see his poor knight hasn't done anything all game. And so he takes back here, and here I wanted to find the the most um, accurate way to go forward here. And of course, I can just, you know, it's winning if I just win the exchange. For example, I could take here, I could take here, but then after I advance this pawn, he just blockades it. Now, of course, I am uh, winning here, but better, uh, more accurate move here is to push d7. And the reason why is after he blockades, then I win this knight out, or this rook outright. Bishop takes a8. And of course, if he takes it, I'm going to promote my pawn. So he plays his knight back here. And computer analysis says I could take here, and uh, that would have been the most accurate move. But again, in this case, when you have such a big advantage, you really just have to not, uh, you just have to find a way not to screw it up. So I just play bishop to c6, just leaving out any complications. Uh, he brings his king over, and now I take here on e5, tries to bring his king over to win this pawn. Uh, the problem is that his e6 pawn is also weak. So I double up here, and here he resigned. So this game uh, centered around uh, the concept of space and using space to accelerate or enhance your development while hindering your opponent's development. And then we use that lead in development and that efficient development to create a more tangible advantage. In this case, uh, a pass pawn and eventual material advantage. So uh, one of the masters of these concepts was uh, Paul Morphy, uh, one of my favorite players and uh, great one of the greatest uh, players uh, ever, I think. And 
uh, analyze a couple of his games. So if you want to check out over there, I'm going to put uh, links uh, links to those over there. Uh, check out uh, Paul Morphy's games to kind of um, continue to study the speedy, efficient development, and then try to use them in your games. I uh, appreciate you guys watching. Uh, if you want to support uh, the channel, you can check out my Patreon page. Uh, I'll have the link down below, and I will see you next time. Check out, oh, check out those videos. Talk to you soon.